I want to begin by expressing our sympathies to you, Timothy and Andrew, and to your family. Uh, May God bless you and comfort you as people we care about because of our love for Sam. And I want to thank you as well for the privilege of bringing God's word on this occasion as we celebrate the life of your brother and our brother, and even more than that, as we give praise to God for the gift of his life. I praise God for the testimonies that have already been given of God's grace through the life of Samuel Shue. There are so many testimonies I could add. I think of the way that Sam's piano playing was first described for me by Robert Carwithen, the church organist and music director in those days. He said he compared Sam's hands to magic handkerchiefs that he would just wave across the keyboard. I could tell you how Sam and Michael and another one of our brothers came to our apartment at the very beginning of our time here in Philadelphia and uh, let us know that they were our elders. Uh, Sam wanted to make it clear that there was a sense in which he could be my shepherd in the beautiful way that those brothers uh, prayed for us and for God's protection on our family from the very first days of our time here at 10th. I could tell you how the late James Montgomery Boyce would speak of Sam Shue. He would do this when he wanted to explain what godly elders we had here at 10th Church Take Sam Shue, for instance, as if he were sort of an ordinary representative of a larger class. And Dr. Boyce would say that although as pastors we could never hope to live up to the piety of our elders, at least we would have their prayers to help us in our work. It's been mentioned how Sam would speak in our session meetings. As a friend said to me this week, he was one of our bedrock and foundational elders. When he spoke, everyone would listen. And he was often encouraging us to have more confidence in the sovereignty of God, more faith in God's plans for the future, more love for the people of God in their suffering and sin. Or I could testify, as so many here could, of the blessing of Sam's encouragement in my life, his generous praise and kind notes. Everyone sensed it. Even my Wheaton friends, who met Sam only briefly when he came to share some remarks at the inaugural luncheon last year, Sam Shue was filled with the love of Christ to an unusual degree. More than any of his natural gifts, which were considerable, This is the grace that distinguished him from most of the people we know. And so I could tell you all of that, but I have not been asked to give further words of testimony, but instead to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from the word of God. And this is especially fitting as we remember the life of a man who was always quick to acknowledge that his abilities came from God, who taught us to praise the giver himself, and not someone who had merely received his gifts. Think of the gesture that Dr. Shu would sometimes make when he had finished playing some beautiful piece of music. First, he would bow in his dignified manner, acknowledging the audience, and I suppose at some level at least enjoying the applause, but clearly it also made him somewhat uncomfortable. Worship should never be directed to a mortal man. And so on occasion, Sam would lift his hands to heaven, redirecting our praise. And what for other musicians might seem staged for him was the essence of his art. And so this morning, I direct your worship to the living God and to his son, Jesus Christ. I do it under the title, as you perhaps have seen in the program, This is Our Father's World. In recent days, many of us have taken consolation from Dr. Shue's dynamic arrangement of the famous hymn, This is My Father's World, a hymn which expresses so clearly the blessings of living in the world that God has created for us and also our hope in the coming victory of Jesus Christ. I want to take that theme. I want to 
expand it. I'm, I'll be doing it from Hebrews chapter 2. I encourage you, I invite you, I ask you please to turn in your Bibles there. It's on page 1000 and 1001. And as we turn here, I, I need to tell you that although in recent days I have grieved deeply for the sudden and awful death of our beloved brother, and especially for the loss to his family, I have not found it within me to remain sad for long. For I think what this death means for our brother himself. Though I grieve for me, I am as happy for him as I could possibly be. Sam Shu has been delivered from every earthly trial, every present sorrow, every form of painful suffering. He now has entered into the very presence of his Savior, his deep longing to be with Christ, which I believe, I observed, was stronger in him than in most Christians, is now satisfied. And so I invite you to consider the locus of our brother's hope, the source of his salvation. Here in Hebrews 2, we have a passage that puts earthly sorrows into eternal perspective. It shows what Jesus has done to conquer death. And it also happens to be a passage that makes what may be the Bible's most important connection between music and the life of Christ. Now, this passage has been read for us already. Obviously, there's more here in in Hebrews 2 than we have time to consider carefully this morning, but even what we do have time to consider will require the best of our thinking, and that is also very fitting because Sam Shu, as many of his students could testify this morning, always demanded that his students give the best of their thought to the life of faith. Notice here a clear statement in verse 10 of the doctrine of creation that God is the maker of everything there is. All things were made by him and for him. This really is our Father's world because he made it. But notice as well a strong statement, and turn back to verse 8 and following, a strong statement of God's sovereignty, of his absolute authority over everything that happens. Nothing lies outside the control of Jesus Christ. Everything is said to be subject to his authority. And yet at the same time, the Bible acknowledges that it does not always seem that way to us. In his world, our Father does have everything under his control, and he has delegated that oversight to his Son, Jesus Christ. But at the present moment, look at the end of verse 8, we do not see it that way. Not everything is seen to be that way. We're living in a fallen world. God has not yet made all things new. And so things happen that seem out of control. I wonder... Have you asked yourself why God allowed this terrible accident to happen? Have you wondered exactly what happened in this moment, in those moments? And have you had a thought that things could have been otherwise, that God could have ordained things in another way? Most of us had really expected more years of friendship, more years of fellowship, more opportunities for instruction and music making. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that what has happened is not somewhere outside God's control, but somewhere inside. This is a fallen world in which people are destined to die, sometimes in shocking and violent ways, But nothing that happens here is outside God's control. Even the suffering is part of his ultimately good purposes for his people. And though we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, and in fact the Bible tells us that we won't see things that way, it nevertheless is the reality of God's sovereign and good purposes for the world. And if we are 
tempted to doubt that sometimes. All we need to do is look at the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the writer to the Hebrews does here. He, he does it by giving us a glimpse of the present glory of Jesus Christ. He looks forward to the end of the story. Right now, Jesus is crowned with glory and honor. That's what it says in verse 9. He reigns at this very moment over all things in heaven and on earth. But this is only because of the suffering that he has endured, including death. Understand that Jesus did not stay outside of our situation, but entered in. This is what we celebrate at Christmas time God the Son becoming a man. The mystery that theologians call the incarnation. And there's a clear statement of it here in these verses of that great mystery. It's as clear a statement, really, as you get anywhere in Scripture. Notice what is said in verse 14. Just as we are made of flesh and blood, Jesus likewise partook of the same things. God the Son became a real human being of flesh and blood. He had the kind of baby that, the kind of body that that needed to be wrapped in swaddling clothes the way that any baby would, the kind that could be laid in a manger. And Sam Shue never uh, never put the incarnation anywhere far from the center of his work as a teacher. He never tired of telling his students of the basic goodness of creation, including the potentiality of music, and never tired of emphasizing that this was strongly affirmed by the humanity of Jesus himself. But now understand that in becoming a human being, Jesus entered not only into the goodness of creation, the goodness of his Father's world, but also into the sorrow and death that, be, that came because of sin. Jesus went through everything that we may go through in this fallen world. Hunger, hardship, Betrayal, pain, grief. Remember the sudden death of his friend Lazarus and the way that Jesus wept outside that stone-cold tomb. But the suffering that Hebrews mainly has in mind here is death. The death specifically that Jesus died on the cross. It's mentioned more than once in this passage. Notice in verse 5 that it is said that Jesus experienced Specifically, the suffering of death, indeed, that he tasted the sorrow of death. Or down in verse 14, it was through death that he destroyed the devil. And so whenever we are struggling with the pain of death, whenever we grieve its painful losses, we need to remember that Jesus is with us as someone who understands because he too has tasted its sorrow. But praise God, Jesus has done more than that. He doesn't just sympathize or empathize. He delivers. Jesus died to conquer death. And so this passage is really about his ultimate triumph. That's the point here. The writer to the Hebrews is saying that having gone through the suffering of death, Jesus now is crowned with glory and honor. His suffering has led to indefectible perfection. He tasted death for us so that we might not simply die, but live again as he does. It was purposeful suffering, an intentional death, through which he destroyed the power of death as well as the devil who held that power. Crucifixion was followed by resurrection. And this has led to our deliverance, not only from death, but if you notice what is sometimes worse for us down in verse 15, it's also the fear of death from which we are delivered. And so we live in the hope of eternal life. Now in describing our deliverance from death through the death of Christ and his sovereign control over everything that happens, Hebrews makes what I believe is an astonishing claim about our connection to Christ. It says that we are his brothers. I want you to notice the family language that is used in this passage. 
verse 10, the scripture says that God has a plan to bring many sons to glory. And let me emphasize, the Holy Spirit is not just talking about boys here. He's also talking about girls. In the ancient world, the right of inheritance typically was reserved for sons. And so in calling all his children sons, God is not neglecting daughters, but he's bringing them in. He's making it clear that they receive a full share of this inheritance. And so this precious truth is for all of us that we are the beloved children of God. This is the family relationship. And our hearts should soar as we hear this promise that God has a purpose to bring many sons and daughters to glory. But now follow the logic here. Jesus Christ is the unique Son of the Father, but if we are also the sons and the daughters of God, that makes Christ our brother, or maybe I should put it the other way around, we are his brothers and sisters. That's the relationship. Even though he is spotless and we are sinful, even though he is divine and we are only human, even though he is eternal and we are merely mortal, nevertheless, Jesus is not ashamed, notice the end of verse 11, to call us his siblings. And Hebrews proves this point with an astonishing quotation from the Old Testament. I want you to really think about this, because once you understand it, I I think it revolutionizes your understanding of music and the Psalms and maybe the whole Christian life. Here is the quotation that we read in Hebrews. It's in verse 12. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Now, according to Hebrews, these are the true words of Jesus. This is something that Jesus the Son has said to God the Father. Notice how the the lead-in. That is why he, and it's talking about the work of Christ, is not ashamed to call us brothers, saying, here's then what Jesus says, quote, unquote. Jesus has promised to tell his brothers and sisters about the Father and to stand in the middle of their congregation with those brothers and sisters to sing the Father's praise. It is the joy of Jesus the Son to make music to his Father's praise. And he does not do this merely by himself, but like a soloist that is supported by a mighty choir, the choir of his brothers and sisters. Now, I want to take this further because I want to ask the question, when does Jesus do this? Let's try to think about this precisely. What is the, the context for this congregational singing with Jesus as the soloist and with us, his siblings, as the choir? Well, to understand it, we'd have to go back to the place in the Old Testament where these words first appear. Do you know where that is? It's a very familiar psalm. Hebrews took this quotation from one of the most important songs in Israel's hymn book, Psalm 22, a psalm of David which expresses really the suffering of a God-forsaken servant. It's a psalm, and many of you will remember this, that, that begins in despair. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? It's the way we sometimes feel, especially when we have lost someone we love. It's the way Jesus felt on the cross when he was carrying the curse of our sin, suffering the Father's wrath. It's why he quoted this very psalm while he was dying. He was experiencing that sense of separation from God. But now, Psalm 22 only begins in despair. It certainly doesn't end that way. David the psalmist, and Jesus the Christ go on in that song to express their hope in God's salvation. They know that death is not the end. God has a plan of life-giving salvation that goes from one generation to the next. And so the singer looks forward to the future worship of God, and he says this, as it is said in the psalm, as it is quoted in Hebrews, I will... Tell of your name 
to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Those are the words of David. According to Hebrews, they're also the words of Jesus. They surely describe his experience of worship with his disciples on this earth. Was he not always doing what this verse says? He was telling of the Father's name to his disciples. You read through the Gospels, it's my Father this and my Father that. This is my Father's world, he was saying to his disciples, but he was really teaching them to call God their Father, so he was really saying to them, this is our Father's world. It's the same way that Jesus would sing, understand that in his earthly life, he used the biblical Psalms in his daily and weekly worship. There's really a sense in which all of the psalms are messianic because they are all the psalms that Jesus sang as the son who loves the father, as the the sweet singer of Israel. He would take these words upon his lips and offer them in praise. To give one example, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, after sharing with his disciples that last supper, the scripture says that together they sang a psalm before going out and all of the events of that last night of his earthly life. But surely that was not the last time that Jesus would ever sing with his brothers. Because as he was dying on the cross, when he was tasting death for all of us, Jesus was thinking of Psalm 22. He was using its its words. He was looking forward to worshiping with those disciples again, to telling them again about the Father and singing the Father's praise. But dear friends, this promise was not just for the first disciples. It is for every child of God, every brother or sister of Jesus Christ, everyone who trusts in him. By the presence of his spirit, even now, Jesus stands with us. He is here today by his spirit, by his word, telling us of the Father's name. Friends, this promise is not just for now. It is forever. The whole thrust of this passage, and indeed really the thrust of Hebrews, is to show us the present heavenly glory of Jesus Christ. It's giving us a sense of present realities which will endure forever. Right now, Jesus is crowned with honor and glory. He is working out his purpose to bring us to glory, the many sons and daughters of the Father, his brothers and sisters. So Hebrews 2 looks backwards to Psalm 22, but also forwards into eternity. Notice the future tense. I will tell of your name to my brothers. I will sing your praise. Jesus is looking ahead to eternity and saying this to God the Father. And think what this means. This is why I am so happy. Think of what this means for our brother Samuel Shu. It means that he has been welcomed into the Father's glory, welcomed by Jesus as his own brother. The Savior he loves has said to him, Samuel, my brother, this is our Father's world, this place of heavenly glory where we will be together forever. And in a sense, they have already begun together to sing the song that never ends. And so I am happy For my brother, though sad for myself and for others who mourn his loss, he has found his heart's desire with all of the Father's children, the brothers and sisters of Jesus who have gone ahead of us to glory. We've been singing about them and will sing about them again in our worship this morning. And it will not be long until we can begin to hear that sweet music. Not be long until they welcome us into that worship with Jesus, our Father's forever world.